<laughs> okay. We are starting to learn about the nervous system. The nervous system basically can be separated either according to structural, where you find it, or functional, what does it do? The structural breakdown of your nervous system comes down to central nervous system or peripheral nervous system. Central nervous system includes the brain and spinal cord. If you are a half of a millimeter outside of the brain or spinal cord, then you are in the peripheral nervous system. In your textbook, they blend the central nervous system and peripheral nervous system in the chapters of the spinal cord and the brain. In the chapter of the brain, it goes through the parts of the brain, but then it also talks about cranial nerves. Well, a nerve is part of the peripheral nervous system. So that chapter is kind of blended structurally. In the spinal cord chapter, it goes through the parts of the spinal cord, which is part of the central nervous system. But then it also goes into spinal nerves. And again, <coughs> nerves are part of the peripheral nervous system. So when you go through those two chapters for brain and spinal cord, please understand towards this, the end of them, it shifts into the peripheral nervous system that is coming off of the brain and spinal cord. So try and keep that in your mind, separate them. Okay, so what is the central nervous system? Brain and spinal cord. If you are out of those two areas, then you are in the peripheral nervous system. A collection of neuronal cell bodies in the central nervous system can have a couple of different names, and I don't want the names to bully you into submission. Mm -hmm. A collection of neuronal cell bodies inside the brain is called a nucleus. Not the organelle, a nucleus. It means a collection of neuronal cell bodies that perform a common function, a clustering. We can think of us as a nucleus. You are a collection of bodies that is part of Kara Street's anatomy class. And we are in our classroom right now, so you can think of that as us being in the brain. But in the spinal cord, we don't call a collection of neuronal cell bodies a nucleus anymore. Instead, we refer to it as horns. When you look at the spinal cord, you'll learn about the dorsal gray horn and the ventral gray horn. And in some places, we can see a lateral gray horn. Here is a very simplistic view through the spinal cord. This, all of this area inside, when you look at it histologically, would be gray. This would be a dorsal gray horn, ventral gray horn, lateral gray horn. So if I say gray horn, lateral, ventral, dorsal, it is again where we're going to find a clustering of cell bodies inside the central nervous system. Sometimes they might be called columns, dorsal column, ventral column. My joke is in anatomy, there is usually two names for everything except for when there seems like there's seven different ones. Okay. In fact, like today, you learned about the left AV valve, which is also called the bicuspid, which is also called the mitral valve. <laughs> Lots of names. 
Let's talk about gray matter versus white matter. Whenever you see gray matter, if that's in the spinal cord or in the brain, if it's gray, that is where we find one of two things. Cell bodies, neuronal cell bodies, or unmyelinated fibers. Now, in unit two, when you were learning about muscle, like a cardiocyte, that was a fiber. In unit one, when you learned about skeletal muscle, a single skeletal muscle cell was a fiber. In this unit, a fiber is an axon. It's that long tail that comes off the neuronal cell body. That is called a fiber. So where, what do you find in gray matter? Cell, cell bodies, bodies or unmyelinated fibers, fibers, axons. Anywhere you see gray. And most of the time, that gray matter will be cell bodies. Somas, that's another name for cell body. Soma means body. Anywhere you see white, white matter, this is from myelination. Myelination comes from one of two cells. This is on your quiz today. What two cells? What two supporting cells cause myelination? One is found in the CNS and one is found in the PNS. What are they? Oligodendrocytes. Holy God, holy God, holy God, <laughs> yeah. That's from the CNS. That is the CNS. Oli oligo, many, oligo. many, many arms. That's what the dendrocytes means. So this one cell can shoot out so many appendages of itself and wrap around and around many different axons from different neurons. That's in the CNS. But what about the one in the PNS that causes myelination? Neuro. Schwann cells, which we shouldn't call them that. The better name is neurolemmacytes. Those do not have many arms. It is a single cell that wraps around an axon. So in the peripheral nervous system, to get myelination, you need a lot of neurolemocytes because it's just one cell wrapping around a part of an axon. And if you want, you can take one of the Kim wipes from underneath your bench and you can have this represent a neurolemocyte. And if you take your pencil, which represents an axon, you could wrap it around many times. And now we start to see white matter. Then we would need another neurolemocyte, and another, and another, and another, and that's just for one axon. Myelination allows action potentials to travel with a greater speed. That means if you're reacting to a stimulus, and what is a stimulus? Um, something that. Hey! <laughs> that was a stimulus. <laughs> it changes. <laughs> it changes the Touch, negativity. Sound. Okay. Vibration, pressure. Vision, smell, taste, those are stimuli. They have to be interpreted. They cause changes in your neurons. Neurons then can have action potentials based on a stimulus if they're good enough, if they're strong enough. Remember in our classroom in unit one and I told you about our number line and we used words like resting membrane potential. And I said every single cell in your body is set up like a battery, a separation of charge. And if the cell gets less negative, more positive, what word was that? Depolarize. 
And if it got close to threshold, remember we talked about that being a trigger point, like shooting a gun? Then we had an action potential occur. Well, a stimulus has to get the cell to depolarize to get closer to threshold. Stimuli can also be inhibitory. They can make the cell hyperpolarize, get further away from threshold. That is still a stimulus. A stimulus is anything that can change the membrane potential of an excitable cell. So let's do it again. What is your central nervous system? Your brain, your brain and your spinal cord. Spine. Anything outside of that is peripheral. peripheral. Okay. If you see gray matter, what does that mean to you? Cell bodies, cell bodies or unmyelinated axons. If you see white matter, what does it mean? Myelinated, Myelinated axons. axons. Good. Clinically, there is a autoimmune disorder called multiple sclerosis. Perhaps you've heard of it. And it is immune cells, T cells, that destroy the cells that provide myelination, the neurolemocytes. When they are destroyed, they are replaced by connective tissue, scar tissue. That is not the same. That is not the same. And that means the action potential gets delayed. And these people have weird sensations. We call it paresthesias, like tingling, like when your arm falls asleep. That's a paresthesia. The number one thing that goes is their vision. That's the number one thing they notice that actually drives them to see a doctor, and the diagnostic nightmare begins. Your optic nerve, one of your cranial nerves, is highly myelinated. And it's one that is prone to be degraded by that autoimmune disorder. So they get a new prescription, and then their vision goes fuzzy again. They go back, get another prescription, it goes fuzzy again. They go back, and that's finally when the opt opt optometrist probably will say, I think you need to go see a doctor. So the T-cells attack the cells that make the sheets or that go sheet? The act well, the cell is the neurolemocyte. Is the sheet. And that is creating the sheath. Okay. Yeah. And there's no cure for that. And the medication is extremely expensive. All we can do is slow down the autoimmune response. That's it. That's it. Okay. Next set of words. If I say somatic, if I say somatic, that means you are aware. You have control. You can have somatic motor neurons. That means you have control over what that neuron is going to target. Skeletal muscle. Don't you have control over your skeletal muscle? That is a voluntary effector. So if the neuron that you had to write about in unit one, remember your essay? You were writing about a somatic motor neuron that released acetylcholine onto the skeletal muscle. Do you remember that part of your essay? Somatic motor. Motor tells you it's an outgoing command. I am giving a command to an effector. Somatic means Voluntary. You have conscious control over it. Somatic sensory means you are aware of that. Do you hear my voice? Are you aware of my annoying voice? Do you feel the seat under your rump right now? Do you feel the temperature of this room? You are aware of it. All of that information is being carried to your brain for interpretation through somatic sensory neurons. You are aware of these senses, these stimuli. If I say visceral, 
then that means you don't have conscious awareness of it and you don't have control over it. If I say visceral motor, that means it is a neuron giving a command but to involuntary effectors, things that do a job for your body that you have no control over. It's on autopilot, like your heart. You cannot say, heart, beat now. No, not then, now. Skip a beat. Why don't you skip a beat? You cannot say to the smooth muscle in your intestines, I feel like going big potty right now. Let's go. <laughs> Although honey would beg to differ with me on that one. <laughs> Pancreas, release insulin right now. Go ahead. Let's do it. You can't do that. You have no conscious control. Those are involuntary effectors. There are four involuntary effectors that are under control of visceral motor neurons. Neurons that are still sending a command, but you can't demand that output. It's happening on its own, autopilot. The four involuntary effectors are cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, glands, adipocytes, fat cells. Wouldn't it be amazing <laughs> if we had conscious control oh, over yeah. our fat cells? Think about that. Oh, here are the ways I would manipulate my fat. <laughs> when honey wants to take me out on a date, I'd squish all the fat up and I'd fill out my <laughs> cocktail dress even better. <laughs> oh, time to go running at the gym? Yeah, smooth that back down to the butt in the thighs. Because <laughs> I don't like having to hoist the girls up so high and tight that they're touching my ears. <laughs> Wouldn't that be amazing? You could just kind of morph your body with yeah. the fat. Oh, someone start working on that. <laughs> I feel like a girl. Was if he was talking about how she wishes, she wishes her vagina was detachable so that she could just leave it at home so if someone wanted to come and rape her in the middle of the night, he'd be like, sorry, left it at home. <laughs> Back in the cabinet. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? Yes. I, I, you all wish that. <laughs> well, I do say in my house, I have a uterine finding device. <laughs> Apparently, you need a uterine finding device to find things in my house. Yeah, me too. Mom, have you seen? Honey, have you seen? And I'm like, let me just strap on my uterine finding device. <laughs> beep, 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 beep. <laughs> And again, honey counters with, I think I do have a uterine finding device. <laughs> you. Yeah. <laughs> Visceral sensory. Visceral sensory means your brain is still getting information about what is happening to your body, what stimuli are affecting it, but you are not aware of it. Do you feel your blood pressure changing right now? Are you aware of that? Are you aware of your pulse rate right now? I mean, sure, you can feel your, your heart start beating faster, especially when you get nervous and scared, but do you know exactly what your heart rate is? You're not aware of that. Are you aware that your pancreas is probably releasing digestive enzymes right now? You don't feel that. You're not aware of that. You are not. So if I say visceral, what do you think of? Do I have control and awareness? I do not have control. I am not aware. If I say somatic, are you aware and you have control? Yes. Somatic sensory, I'm aware. Somatic motor, I have control. I can give that command. 
visceral sensory, I am not aware. I don't have, I don't know what my blood pressure is right now. Visceral motor, I cannot consciously control the release of enzymes from my pancreas or my stomach. Visceral has everything to do with the autonomic nervous system. Think autonomic, think autopilot. You don't really, you don't have control over that. It's on autopilot. We're talking about involuntary effectors. And that is going to take quite some time to learn how the body targets those involuntary effectors. And again, in a clinical setting, we go after this a lot. There are a lot of medications people are on to regulate your involuntary effectors. Your nervous system, you just heard me describe it in a functional way. Motor, sensory. Sensory is anything coming from your body, from your external environment, to your brain and spinal cord for interpretation. What should I do about it, if anything? Some of those sensory stimuli you're aware of. I feel the temperature in this room. I feel the hard seat under my butt. I hear Kara, I see Kara. Some sensory information is getting to your brain that you are not aware of, like your blood pressure changing right now, what your pancreas is doing. Motor, outgoing, outgoing command. If it's a motor outgoing command going to voluntary effectors, then it's a somatic motor command. If it is going to the involuntary effectors, it is a visceral motor command. Okay? Now, I'm going to go through the 12 cranial nerves. They are numbered using Roman numerals. If you do not know your Roman numerals, please see me so I can teach you. But that's how we number them. This is at the end of the central nervous system lecture. If you're, sorry, this is at the end of the peripheral nervous system lecture. Do you want the G-rated way to remember your cranial nerves? Or the not so G rated way. Not G rated. Not sure. <laughs> this is the G rated way. O, 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 to touch and feel. Very good velvet. Ah, heaven. <laughs> what does it stand for? And, and these are on the next few slides. The first O, olfactory. Olfactory nerve is cranial nerve number one. The second O, cranial nerve number two, is the optic nerve. Cranial nerve number three, the third O, is oculomotor. Cranial nerve four, the T for two, is the trochlear nerve. Cranial nerve five, which is weird, it's called the trigeminal. Tri, tri means three branches. So it's cranial nerve five and it has three branches. What was it? Try what? Try general. Cranial nerve six is called the abducens. Cranial nerve seven is the facial nerve. Cranial nerve eight is the vestibulocochlear nerve. Cranial nerve nine is the glossopharyngeal. This is in your lab hit list and it's also in the PowerPoint. Cranial nerve 10 is your vagus nerve not spelled like the city, V-A-G-U-S. Cranial nerve 11 is called the accessory spinal nerve, so A for accessory. And cranial nerve 12 is called the hypoglossal nerve. The not so G-rated way to remember this. O-O-O, to touch and feel. 
very good vagina. <laughs> ah, heaven. <laughs> <laughs> to go along with Marissa's comment about her vagina. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the after facial? Yeah, she was talking about how when she goes running at night, she wishes that her yes. vagina, she used another word, was detachable. So if she wanted to go running at night, she could leave it at home. That way, if someone came along and wanted to rape her, she'd be like, sorry, left it at home. Nothing you can do. <laughs> I think it's like Wanda. Yeah, I just plug the hole. Wanda's Oh. Probably. <laughs> now, these 12 cranial nerves, they can be sensory, sensory only, like your olfactory nerve. It smells. It's not doing a command. It's not doing an outgoing command. It's bringing the sensory information, stimuli to your brain to interpret. What is that foul smell I am smelling next to Stephen? <laughs> I wear a great color. <laughs> Optic nerve, vision, that's sensory only. Some of these cranial nerves will give motor only. Could be motor that's somatic, which means what? So, if I say somatic motor, it's can you control it? Control, voluntary, skeletal muscle. It's going to target. Some of them are going to give visceral motor, which means what? Involuntary. It's going to target involuntary effectors: cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, glands, adipose tissue. Some of them can be mixed. They can do both. Now you need to understand. When a nerve is mixed, <clears throat> um, may I please play with your hair? Can I put you on camera? Yeah. And post it on YouTube? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Star is born. <laughs> it's okay. You're beautiful. So if I take some of Adriana's hair, and I think of the actual hair as axons from her neurons. Some of these axons are carrying action potentials to her brain. That means afferent, incoming, sensory. Sensory information goes to our brain and spinal cord for interpretation. But some of these axons are carrying output commands, motor. Those go out, efferent, away. When a nerve is mixed, it is bound up in connective tissue. And all of those axons are in that nerve. But you need to think of them, if you could separate them, some of them are carrying action potentials to the brain and spinal cord, afferent, incoming, and that's not how we say it. We don't say afferent, it's afferent. Some of them are outgoing, motor, efferent, that's not how we say it, it's efferent. But on a video, it's difficult to hear afferent and efferent and distinguish the difference. So I'm going to say it wrong on purpose, afferent, incoming sensory, efferent, outgoing, motor. So some of these cranial nerves have sensory parts and some have motor parts. And the motor can be visceral or somatic and the sensory could be visceral or somatic. It's a lot, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so here are the cranial nerves that have Double components, yes, Tia. Um, on some of them, it says uh, they're parasympathetic. Yes, <laughs> we're going to get to oh. that. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I have listed which of the cranial nerves have both, which ones are sensory, and which ones are motor only. Now I'm going to jump to the very last slide. And do you, again, do you want G-rated or not so G-rated? Not I'll give you both. <coughs> <laughs> Memorizing this list like this is tedious, isn't it? 
which cranial nerves are motor only, sensory versus both. So I'm going to jump to the very last slide. S stands for sensory, M stands for motor, B stands for both. And I put them in order. It's cranial nerves 1 through 12. Some say marry money, but my brother says big brains matter most. So that means cranial nerve 1 is sensory. Cranial nerve 2 is sensory. Cranial nerve 3 is motor. Cranial nerve 4 is also motor. Cranial nerve five, it has both. It is both sensory and motor. Cranial nerve six, motor only. That means outgoing command, remember. Cranial nerve, where am I? Seven. Seven is both, facial nerve, is both sensory and motor. Cranial nerve eight, vestibular cochlear. Hearing, equilibrium. Definitely sensory. Cranial nerve nine, both. Both sensory and motor. Cranial nerve 10, again, uh, it is both. 11, motor only, and 12, motor only. Now here's the not so G-rated way to remember this. Some say marry money, but my brother says big boobs matter most. <laughs> <coughs> Feel free to pick which one you want to use as your acronym. Now, believe it or not, we just covered quite a bit that we do for your quiz today, didn't we? Mm -hmm. Oh, I know. <laughs> I'm not stupid. <laughs> Now these cranial nerves, they come from parts of your brain, from the midbrain and down. You have not learned the parts of the brain yet, but the midbrain, <coughs> pons, and medulla oblongata are part of what's called your brain stem. So it's the inferior part of your brain. Do not memorize, do not memorize what part of the brain stem these cranial nerves come from. I do not test you on that. I don't. Yes. <clears throat> so my picture, just for viewers at home. <laughs> this is my sad attempt drawing the cerebral hemispheres. This part is my sad attempt showing you the cerebellum. And then this part right here is me drawing the brain stem, the height, the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. Okay, cranial nerve one. Some say marry the money, but my brother says big brains matter most. So cranial nerve one, olfactory, sensory only, smell. When you have your exam on the cranial nerves, I also want you to know what we can expect if you have nerve damage to that particular cranial nerve. So if someone punches you in the nose and breaks through your cribriform plate with the olfactory foramina where these nerve endings come through, you're going to have a problem smelling, aren't you? Yes. yes. And therefore tasting. Cranial nerve two, optic nerve. Sensory, it's vision. Hey, guess what will happen if you damage your optic nerve? Can't see. You won't see as well. <laughs> Absolutely. So you're going to have visual defects. Cranial nerve three, oculomotor. Its name tells you what it does. Moves the eye. Moves the eye. And the oculomotor nerve, cranial nerve three, innervates, communicates to four out of the six extraocular muscles you got tested on on Monday. You know, like superior rectus, inferior rectus, medial rectus, lateral rectus, superior oblique, inferior oblique. Which of the four does cranial nerve three target? Well, we can turn it into a chemistry 
molecular formula, if you will. We can say, and I wrote it up on the board, LR6, SO4, everything else is 3, which means the lateral rectus is the only one innervated by cranial nerve 6. SO, superior oblique, innervated by cranial nerve 4, which will be on the very next slide. Everything else is 3, the oculomotor. That means medial rectus, superior rectus, inferior rectus, inferior oblique. Good? So that is cranial nerve 3. Now, Deanna said, well, Kara, it says in our lab hit list that some of these cranial nerves are parasympathetic. Cranial nerve 3, shown here, is part has parts, <coughs> using Adriana's hair again, there are some parts of it that are part of your autonomic nervous system. And it's going to target involuntary effectors, things you don't have control over. Make your pupil constrict. Come on, show me pupillary constriction. Make it happen, squeeze. Can't do it. <laughs> Cranial nerve three is part of the pathway targeting the smooth muscle in the iris of your eye and it would cause pupillary constriction. You have no conscious control over that. We will spend considerable amounts of time practicing our autonomic nervous system. Today is just an introduction. Cranial nerve 4 is motor. It targets the superior oblique. Remember, S L LR6, SO4, everything else is three. Superior oblique, which causes your eyeball to move down and out. Remember, depress and abduct. It had two actions. Cranial nerve five. Cranial nerve five is both. It has motor and it has sensory components. <clears throat> motor, primarily it's going to target muscles of mastication. Chewing muscles. Also goes after your temporalis. We remember that up here. It's also a chewing muscle. Because it elevates the mandible. And you're going to learn when you listen to your ear lecture that it's going to also target the tensor tympani. And I think of TT and I think of trigeminal. TT, trigeminal. The tensor tympani is a muscle in your middle ear that when cranial nerve targets, cranial nerve 5 targets it, it helps stabilize some of the bones in your middle ear so you don't rupture your eardrum especially if you were going to say air shows. Huntington Beach just had their air show and all the jets fly over. It's craziness. Well, your tensor tympani, make sure that those ossicles, remember your ossicles, your, your malleus, your incus, your stapes, that they don't jostle too much and break through your eardrum. Sensory, just to give you an idea, how many of you get migraines? You've got cranial nerve five to thank. So from now on, when you get a migraine, I want you to go, yeah, damn cranial nerve five. <laughs> Pain in your teeth? I gotta go to the dentist. Cranial nerve five. Oh, I know. In fact, when they give you your anesthesia before they start drilling, they'll give you the anesthesia locally at the tooth where they're gonna start drilling. And usually they wait a while for the lidocaine to take effect. And lidocaine, by the way, blocks sodium voltage-gated channels. So you can't get the action potential, the sensory action potential going to your brain. It's blocked. So then your brain can't go, ow! And they'll come after a while, and then your dentist might say, let me know if you feel this. And they start drilling, right? <laughs> If you're like me, <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> My dentist knows 
now that I, I need more of a block. And they'll go way back here. Ha ha ha. Cranial nerve five is called the trigeminal because it has three branches. The part that goes by your eye, ophthalmic. Part that goes by your maxilla, maxillary. And part that goes down to your mandible, mandibular, three. Where it splits back here, aha uh ha, -huh, aha. Uh -huh. And if you don't go numb at the tooth where they need a drill, they will ha 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 ha. They will shoot you up way back there. And then your whole train starts to sit. <laughs> and you must have some mastication. And they're, they're paralyzed. And, they're, they're, they're. and that's why you bite your cheek, because those muscles of mastication can't move out of the way. <laughs> your water spills out. And you just have to say, and you're dreaming, and you don't even feel it. And it's just there. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. This cranial nerve five, cranial nerve six, your F2 sense. It is motor and it targets your lateral rectus. It only goes after one extra ocular muscle. What would happen if your lateral rectus is, is the nerve can't target it? You're going to have a problem with getting abduction. That's why it's called the abducens nerve, right? Lateral rectus causes abduction of your eyes. So you're going to have a problem with moving your eyes laterally. Cranial nerve seven is a biggie. It is both. It's got sensory, it's got motor, and not just motor to voluntary effectors, to involuntary, which means it's part of the parasympathetic division. It's part of your autonomic nervous system. <coughs> So cranial nerve 7 for motor to muscles you can control, it's your muscles of facial expression. Your orbicularis oculi, your orbicularis oris, okay, those are all muscles of facial expression. So is this um, nerve get affected like any other stroke? Yep. Okay. And we'll talk about the parts of the brain that can communicate to these nerves that target skeletal muscle for voluntary movement. Um, have you heard of Bell's palsy? Okay, so cranial nerve seven comes out from your, your ear, kind of back here. And it goes through your parotid gland, a very large gland, and it has five parts, let me say, two Zanzibar by motor car. You don't need to worry about that, but it's got five branches. And when someone gets like the mumps, which is a viral infection of their parotid gland, we shouldn't be getting the mumps if we've had our vaccinations. But that inflammation can impinge on the nerve and then they get Bell's palsy where it looks like that side of their face is just sliding off their skull because they, they, can't, they can't control it. So they look like, who's the character from Batman, Two-Face? No, is it Two-Face? Yeah, is it Two-Face? Right. Okay. Anyway, they can't, they can't close their orbicularis, they can't close their eye. So they have, when they fall asleep at night, they have to tape their eyelid closed because they can't control closing their orbicularis oculi. It usually self-resolves. There is no intervention needed. It just can take weeks to months. When I took anatomy with the medical school students, every time we had, every time we had an examination, this poor sweet guy, he, he it would flare up his Bell's palsy and he'd show up for the exam with just half his face Aww. sliding out. It was, I know. Give him a couple weeks and he'd be right back, right as rain. And then the next test. Yeah, and then the next test is sliding off his face again. So 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 it can flare up, but it doesn't mean that you will. it will repeat. It's just so happened in him. And I think it was mostly for him how he was studying like this and putting pressure on it is what I think, that's my hypothesis, is what caused it for him. Sensory, the anterior two-thirds of your tongue for taste. 
is for cranial seven. And then cranial nerve eight, vestibular cochlear nerve, sensory only. It's going to be important for you to have action potentials that your temporal lobe can interpret as sound and different kinds of sound. And also for equilibrium. Do you have vertigo? Do you feel dizzy? That is all cranial nerve eight sending action potentials to your brain. Cranial nerve nine is another big hitter. It is mixed. It has sensory, it has somatic motor, and visceral, which means, Deanna, it is, again, part of the parasympathetic division. Just to say it, parasympathetic division is in control of your body when you are at rest, when you are peaceful, like now. Parasympathetic division, we say resting, digesting, peeing, and reading. All the things you can do when you aren't running for your life is the parasympathetic division. If you're running for your life, now is not the time to digest the hamburger you just ate. <laughs> if you are running for your life, now is not the time to turn to your predator and say, excuse me, I gotta go potty. <laughs> if you are running for your life, now is not the time for your heart rate to be low. So sympathetic is calm, sorry, Parasympathetic is calm blue ocean. Right now, most of you, your parasympathetic division is mostly in control of your body. Sympathetic is nothing to do with these cranial nerves. Sympathetic is the four Fs. Fight, flight, freeze, sex. <laughs> <Dead>. <laughs> Fornication. I don't know what you were thinking. <laughs> Parasympathetic. Rest, digest, calm blue ocean. Okay. Parasympathetic versus sympathetic. Both target a man's penis, but in very different ways. P.S. I love you. P.S. Point and shoot. <laughs> P. Parasympathetic. P for point. Erection. S. Sympathetic. Shoot. <laughs> That's right. Ejaculation. <laughs> <laughs> what can a man frequently wake up with in the morning? Point. Point. <laughs> An erection. That's what we're talking. Point. <laughs> Parasympathetic. Okay, what comes out of a man's penis? P and sperm. P and ejaculate. Um, I think we all can agree. Those of us in a heterosexual relationship right now, or homosexual, doesn't matter. We would prefer to know what's about to come out of that man's penis at any given time. That's important. It's important to know what we're going to get. <laughs> and we would like the plumbing not to be crossed. So parasympathetic is in charge of peeing. Sympathetic, that's ejaculation. Two different divisions. That's good. Yes. <laughs> Because we would prefer not to be peed in. <laughs> Unless you're into that. I don't know. <laughs> 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 